So now I'm going to talk a little bit about volatility modeling using time series and R. I'm going to use Garch processes, which a lot of people have studied. Um, it's generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity models. There's a whole bunch of them. I'm just going to do the basic standard Garch, and I'm going to do exponential Garch, which works a little bit. Um, it's pretty used often for uh, exchange rate modeling. So what I'm going to do basically is I'm going to use the yen per dollar. I'm going to take log changes for returns or percentage changes on monthly time series. And then I'm going to, uh, first of all, show you the, kind of what package to use. I use RU, RU Garch. Um, and then I'm going to show you what the, the process, how the process works, and then I'll show you what the results look like. All right, so uh, anyway, we're going to model uh, volatility. Uh, a lot of people have probably have already seen this, but GARD stands for Generalized Autoregressive Conditional Heteroscedasticity. Essentially, you're modeling two equations at once. You have some sort of uh, what is called a mean equation. It's going to be the, the model that has residuals. It's either a regression model or it's like an ARIMA model. And then instead of those residuals being white noise, it's going to be a time varying volatility model. In other words, past values either of innovations or past errors or the past volatility series will have a, a significant impact on variation today. And so you're going to get a time varying volatility series using GARCH processing or processes. So anyway, um, I've got my data uploaded on my website. Um, you can pull it up and uh, It'll pull, and then you can look at the tail. It's always good to just make sure you have what you hope you're looking at. This is taken from um, FRED data. Um, and anyway, it's got the uh, yen per dollar, and I've got this is monthly data all the way up to October 2019. And so I've, I've pre-uploaded this. And so this is the what I call the level, which is uh, you know the, the actual value of the monthly average of the exchange rate. So you can see I set it as a time series. I only take the second column. Here I use end because I know the last date. I don't have to go to the beginning. But I cut it off to begin in 1974 because that's after Bretton Woods ended. And so it's the period of floating currencies. So it's going from 1974 to 2019 and because it's monthly I've got frequency as 12 and then I'm going to run that all right so now I've got capital E which is the time series in levels okay and then I take log differences which is going to approximate percentage changes I did not multiply it by a hundred um, it doesn't really change anything but it, now I have little e which is the returns okay so I'm going to plot it and I've got an extra line for a zero line in dark gray and I've adjusted the labels and stuff and so here is my yen per dollar I didn't put a title on it we're just looking at it but you can see here that, that roughly five percent to negative ten percent you can see a big drop in the yen right around the Asian crisis here um, but you can see this is what it looks like in terms of the up and down movement and you can see there's periods of, of much more volatility clustering and that's what the whole point of GARCH processes are for you're trying to find periods of high volatility periods of low volatility right? so what I'm doing for the mean equation again this could be a structural model some sort of some sort of time series regression um, I'm going to do just a little bit of box Jenkins. I'm going to go with an AR1, which is pretty simple. I personally try to keep as simple of a model as possible. You can do an elaborate search process to find the best ARIMA model, but it's going to change when you add GARCH. So um, essentially, you're going to change the residual series to be, again, not being white noise, but it's going to have a pattern to it. So uh, simpler is better. And so I, you can start, you can look at the ACF, and you can see if you know Box Jenkins, it's, it does decay. Um, partial autocorrelation function does, it's got a few spikes here, but for the most part, it, it has one spike. So this is telling me it's an AR1. All right, and so I model it as uh, ARIMA 100, and you can see here that the uh, autocorrelation is indeed significant. Intercept is not. Um, but it is, you know, it looks like a good model. I do an AR2 as well. You know, we're going to add a parameter. We see here the AR2 is not significant, and so that is not a good addition. And then ARMA11, we had an MA parameter that is also not significant, so AR1 is better. And so that's what I go with. And I do this a lot in my own work on um, exchange or volatility, so kind of sticks with what I'm used to. So I've got library, and I'm going to take. Um, are you GARCH? So it's R for the obviously for the software, and then U is univariate. So it's a univariate GARCH, GARCH package, and that's supposed to multivariate GARCH, where you can have spillovers and volatility among different variables. So we're just simply doing yen dollar log changes, uh, looking at appreciations and depreciations in, in this one currency. Okay, so using this package. This is what it looks like. Okay, so I'm going to call it G1 originally. So, but here you take U, U spec, 
and then you have a variance model in here and so if you look at all the parameters this again I, I got this code and changed it for what I need um, S is for standard if you're familiar with Garch you know all sorts of things where uh, you know there's there's uh, I garge, E garge, P garge, T garge, all sorts of garges. And and I think sometimes call it the garge zoo. But really we're going to be having um like really just the, the what they call the workhorse, which is the the garge one one. Okay, and so if you remember, I don't have the model in front of me, but the first one is as one lag of past errors, so E or epsilon, and then this is H or the past garch, right? So it actually involves the volatility as a function of past errors and past volatility. Okay, and you can change the model and try and find an optimal, but but this is the most commonly used is one one, right? So standard garch one one, and then the mean model again, which just gives you sort of the baseline, which gives the errors. Here's Again, I, this is the standard code here, but it's one zero. It's an R mode one zero or an AR one, and then standard deviation distribution. Okay, and then the next thing you do is you could fit it, and so we're fitting the Garch model to the data E. Okay, and then we're going to examine the coefficients in the model. So I, I first I make G one, then Garch one one is fitting that model using the data and my specified Garch model. Okay, so if you run that, now you get a bunch of output here. Okay, and I'm not really going to go through all of it, but because what you normally see printed, or at least published, is the following, okay, and so um, you've got the optimal parameters, then you've got robust standard errors, you see the, the estimate, the coefficients are the same, all right, the standard errors do differ enough to kind of change the significance in a couple places uh, today, but, so you have AR1, right, it was a little bit higher than 0.3, now it's a little bit lower, but it's significant, intercept is again not significant, omega, that is the intercept on the Garch model, remember it's simultaneously estimating two equations using maximum likelihood, okay, and so the alpha is on the past errors and the beta is on the past Garch, and you can see here that these are both significant as well, so neither intercept is significant but AR1 is, and then both of the Garch terms are significant at 5%. Right. Now, if you, if you look down here, nothing really, actually it does change the p-value, but it doesn't really change the significance of 5%, okay? So then you got the different information criteria. If you do want to um, evaluate different models, you could like minimize the Schwartz, Bayesian criterion or whatever you want, but I'm just doing this one to show. Okay, it's got a little bit long box looking for uh, the residuals and so forth, but uh, we do see that the Garch model does have significant variables, okay? So if you, if you trust your Garch model, then I'm going to make volatility an E here. You can, if you trust your, your model, you can make a volatility series. So I'm going to set a time series, and I'm going to take my Garch 1-1 one, one that I just fitted. Within the fit, you can get sigma squared, okay, which is the variance because it's standard deviation squared. And, and and I'm setting my time series to end at the same point, and it's also has a frequency of 12. So so again, in Garch 1, 1, of, out of all this output, you can look inside the fit, and then you can get the variance. Okay, so this is the volatility term, and and so we can we can look at it. And you see here that it, it's fairly low because it's you know it, it's based off of these small percentages, but it, it's all positive, and it it is it does vary over time. Okay, so now I'm going to plot it with axes and a header. And so this is the J Japanese yen per dollar volatility using the Garch 1-1. And you can see here that there's periods of high volatility. If you know, um, you know the eco economic climate, um, this was the Asian crisis, 1997-1998. Big spike in volatility, and then of course the Great Recession led to yen volatility. And if you know the, the period better than I do, you might know what events were causing this. But you can see the spikes of high volatility, and then there's a fairly tranquil period after 2000 of low volatility. Okay, so we used the RU Garch package to make a time series of volatility, which is literally the variance based on a, a standard Garch 1 1 model. Okay, and I mentioned before that I, in exchange rates you see exponential Garch. Again, I, I assume you kind of have seen this model already, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this, but this is asymmetric. The idea is that positive and negative innovations have different effects, and so you could have a positive shock, a currency, something like currency appreciation, could have a different effect from a negative shock or depreciation. And, that, and so, again, positive would be the dollar appreciating, negative would be the yen appreciating. But the idea is that uh, you know it's possible that the downward swings have a different effect than the upward swings. Okay, so this is one of many possible models for a Garch process that are outside. 
outside of standard guards. But this is fairly commonly used. It has an extra component, uh, basically splitting positive and negative. So I call it G1E for with the E stands for exponential, and all you can see here is the model is now EGARCH. Everything else is the same. So it uses the EGARCH model instead of the SGARCH model. Okay, the rest of the code is almost the same here, and I can look here and get the coefficients, and I can look at uh, my model as well. All right, so I first I name it. Let me just do this line here. You can see what the coefficients look like. And there's an alpha. Remember, this is my error process. This is the intercept, the alpha, and the beta. But now there's this extra gamma, which is the you know splitting the positive and the negative. Okay, the different shocks. All right, so. Um, now what I'm going to do is I am going to, I can show you this first, and right, this is all the output as well, and I wanted to show you this here, which is that the gamma and beta are both significant, okay, so um, alpha is not, but the beta and gamma are, okay, so uh, you could say, well, you know, perhaps it is uh, you know, an, a decent model. But if you look at the robust standard errors now, you see that this gamma is not significant at 5%. So this is giving me kind of a red flag that perhaps exponential GARCH is not preferred to GARCH. So my, my philosophy, again, I use an AR1 if possible. Simpler is better. GARCH1 is better um, than the alternatives. I tend not to go uh, off the path a lot of people go, which is to like use the, the most complex, fanciest model, try and find some result no one else has found. Simpler models tend to do a little bit better. So I'm using I would probably go with standard GARCH here, but you know you can play around with it and see maybe there is an optimal model. You can change the lengths, you can change the the lag lengths and, and stuff. You can try and find you know the, the lowest AIC or something. But but given a choice between these two, I would probably take the standard GARCH. Okay, so we can plot it. All right, I gotta actually make it, and I will plot it. All right. Well, the other thing is I also if you look at the AIC, um, it is a little bit I think a little bit lower. For, uh, there's negative 4.559 up here. The AIC was, um, let me see, I probably missed it here. I don't know where it Oh, 0.4558. All right, so, so maybe they are pretty close. But uh, you don't see much improvement in the model. Um, actually, the other, I think that the standard garage does have a slightly better AIC. So, but I mostly would look at that insignificant coefficient. So, I'm guessing standard is better, but we, it's good to compare the two. So, this is the eGarch 1 1. Again, I'm just changing the, the parameter. You can see that it has similar patterns around the Asian crisis and the 2008 crisis and so forth. So, we can we can compare them. Simple way to see how similar they are. You can look at the correlation 0.967 highly similar, but if you plot them, you're going to see that one of them has higher extremes. Okay, so standard guards tends to have higher highs in certain spots. Exponential does not. So there is a slight difference in the uh, residual or the, the variance series that are reported. Right now, if you want to dig a little further, I'm just looking at the difference between the two. I could look at um, the you know make a variable of the difference, and I could plot it. I don't really know what exactly is driving this. I kind of looked. Um, you can you can play around with this. You can see like what is about these times where one is the better. And, and I, I didn't see any uh, relationship to uh, depreciations, appreciations. But that's something you could look at. Is is the is the difference greater if the exchange rate is different? Or maybe there's some third variable out there that drives it. I, I didn't look into it. All right. So um, if if you want to. Uh, kind of look at maybe uh, this a different way. I just made a scatter plot. Okay, so I've got the, this difference and I'm plotting it along E, which is the returns. Okay, and so I've got my difference here. This is zero and zero, and so you got kind of four quadrants. And so here, over here is um, where a GARCH is larger, over here is where eGARCH is larger, and then you have dollar appreciations and depreciations. So maybe there's something about a rising yen that makes GARCH better or so forth. I don't really know how to interpret that, but that's one thing you can do with the data and, and, and analysis, other than simply look at AIC or other criteria. All right. So there's kind of a couple things I was trying to do today. Um, one is to show you how to just use the RU GARCH package. All right. So uh, that there are other packages that people like. One is FGARCH. I've, I've seen a bunch. I use, I use R, RU GARCH. But take a data series, set a time series, and then we get to log differences in the dollar yen pre, uh, exchange rate. Okay, and then um, we first find a mean model. I took an AR1, and then the error is modeled as a 
GARCH series, and so we compared GARCH 1.1 with eGARCH 1.1. Probably the standard GARCH is a little bit better, but um, you, know, you can look at other ones. You can see maybe you find a model that's a little bit, has a little bit more explanatory power. But the big idea is just to use the RU GARCH package and then take your mean model and then model a variance series. And then you can start to do things to interpret it. You can use your knowledge of the economy. You can look at various correlations and other measures. And then you can start to use it to explain real things. And in this case, we're looking at what periods the yen dollar volatility was higher than others.